Everybody speed? Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Paul Pod. This is our final guest for the season, Paul Pod for Curtain Call 2. I have the distinct displeasure of welcoming Eminem, ladies and gentlemen. Eat a dick, ladies and gentlemen. All right, so I can see how this is going to go. This is going to be fun. We've talked to several people throughout your career and leading up to the music that was sourced for your project, Curtain Call 2. And it included people like Royce the Five Nine, Skylar Gray, Adam Blackstone, as well as James Larris. And now we are here talking to yourself. And we just want to go over some of the stuff that helped create this masterpiece of hits that we are debuting with the world. So I guess we can start back where we left off from Curtain Call 1, right? Which okay. is the greatest hits compilation. You'd finished putting out Encore. You put out Curtain Call. Which had FAC went, on it. Probably my best yes. song ever. Yes. FAC yeah. was a masterpiece. But, but at we, the time, you didn't think yeah. so. Remember, you thought at the that time, was- I thought it was ridiculous, but and I still think it's ridiculous. But now I I appreciate its ridiculousness. Best song I ever made. Yeah, it not clearly, even close. It's not even close. Not, nothing is close. No. Lose yourself can can go fuck itself. That like we can change the title. Huh? Fuck yourself instead of lose yourself. Anyway, you ah you you put out the greatest hits album. The the two new songs on there were Fac and When I'm Gone. When I'm gone. Right, which is one of the saddest, most depressing songs you've ever recorded. And that is so, in the company of Fact. Yes. We we've we've established that. It makes it even Fact. more emotional. Oh yeah, yeah. Clearly. Seri- very serious yeah. song. So you go away for a while after that. You had been dealing with obviously your your addiction and recovery, and some time goes by. And you start to record and make music again. So the first project that we get to hear from you post recovery is and, an album with a, with a bunch of fucking accents on it. Was, was, well, we're going to get to that. So, yeah. so you were, you were sober and you made an album called relapse, which is sort of ironic, right? But mm-hmm. I guess it was sort of a, a, a ironic way to say you were relapsing into making music again, as opposed to, to drugs. So, what can you remember? I know you're going to talk about the accents, but what can you remember about that process and how you arrived in that creative place back then? I remember like when I first got sober and all the shit was out of my system. I remember just being like really happy. And, you know, everything was like fucking new to me again. Right. So it was the it was the first album and the first time that I had had fun recording in a long time. So during this fun, something happened and something like completely morphed into like a lot of my songs have always been like that. Like you joke around with friends and shit and then you might put some of that shit in a song. Yeah. But I don't know, man. It was like the first time I started having fun with music again and, and, and like relearning how to rap. You remember that whole process (laughs) was really took a long time. For my brain it to start did. working again. Yeah. I mean, you you literally were coming off of, you know, an, an overdose and, you know, they had to sort of stabilize you with a few medications and some of them took you a minute to adjust to. Let's mm-hmm. just leave it at that. Right. So you're learning how to rap again, almost literally. Right. Because it's the first time probably you were creating without having substances in your body in in however many years. Right. Yeah. So it's a whole different experience. Did, didn't you ask the doctors when I started recording new shit, when I first started rapping again and sent it to you, didn't you say like, he, I just yeah, want to make I sure he doesn't have brain damage. Yeah. I, I, I thought you might, I thought you might have some permanent problems. Yeah. I was concerned for sure. Detroit uh, basketball. You know, some of that stuff, you know, that you recorded back then was, it was like, you know, nobody was pushing you and you were just finding your way and doing it slowly. But, you know, yeah, like a record that leaked out that Detroit basketball record, it wasn't good. 
Yeah, bro, that shit was like that was. I think that was the first thing I actually wrote. Yeah, uh, literally, I think that was the first song. Right, and it was so, fucking weird because like as my brain was turning back on, I <laughs> I started going over lines like, wait, is that that's not good. And I do, if you remember, I don't know which version leaked, but if you remember there was like 20 versions of that shit. Yeah, you kept going back to it. I mean, listen, you were you were figuring it out. But, you know, it didn't take long after that time period started that you all of a sudden were like really back in it. It was quick. It, it was it was certainly concerning, but we're only talking about course of maybe five or six months total. Right? I don't know if you remember this, but the first recording session we did when we we're serious about recording the album. We went to Florida, right? Yeah. And you remember I was itching constantly, like my fucking skin was crawling. And what I didn't realize at the time was that was the barbiturates coming completely out of my system. So I was so still, still withdrawing. I was still, yeah, to, with, with it to an extent. Yeah. I mean, I was taking fucking 75, 80 volume a night. Yeah, I don't know how you survived that. I don't well, either. You, you I, almost didn't. That's 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 yeah. the truth. So you're down there, you're you're itching, right? Yeah. And you're still itching making and recording. Music and recording. And what do you remember what the first records were that you recorded for Relapse that ended up making the album? Ganja, I know was one. Right. Was it Ganja? So Dre was down there in Orlando and you were working with Dre. Yeah. And you did you did Ganja. I think he did my mom. Yeah, he right? was like feeding me beats. And I think Ganja was first and then maybe my mom was second. Yeah. And at some point you record, you know, a, an important record um, for the album because it sort of framed the creative. And you record 3 a.m. Mm -hmm. What what was going through your mind? And I know we're about to get into the accent. So tell me tell me what you were thinking when you recorded that. Well, OK, a couple of things come into play. One, I had just started, like, I started watching a bunch of, like, fucking serial killer documentaries and shit. Right, because there's a fucking lot of them out there. Yeah, and it's like it started giving me ideas. Like, I could, if I tried to sound like a demented fucking serial killer, and if you remember this, too, Beautiful came out of earlier sessions when I was still fucked up. It was probably the yeah. only decent song I had made during that time. Right. It and was I didn't one, want to it put it on the, the album. I didn't want to put it on the album because it didn't fit the concept of everything else and the accents right. and all that shit. I remember that. The accents, they built up. Like, they started just getting thicker and thicker. And I don't even know what, yeah. what fucking accent, accents they are. It's like fucking Irish, well, German. It's I, interesting to me because I, I didn't really notice it. And I was just so <clears throat> excited that you were making music and having a good time with it. And the fact that we were going to be able to put a project together that it just sort of was going on and I didn't think about it. Yeah. Right. And I don't, I don't know why, but it just, I don't think I was the only one. Yeah. At the end, I went to play some music for some people and they were like, yeah, he's, he's rapping really well again, but like, what's up with the accents? <laughs> and, I was Bro. Like, and I was like, what do you, wait, what do you mean? And they're like, you don't hear that he's like talking funny. And they were talking about like 3 a.m. And I was like, oh, well, that's he's just like, you know, bending his voice. And what I had always thought was that you were using the accents to bend words. Well, that too. To make, to make them fit together. Yep. Right. Because if you say a word a certain way, it's going to connect with another word that it might not otherwise connect with. Mm -hmm. That's what my I assumed. You remember I don't know if you remember this, but in Florida, I don't know if you remember how fast I was writing. Like it was fucking crazy. Yeah, it was flying out of you. Pause. I, I, I do. I do remember that. And and in particular, I remember the record Underground. That was one of my favorites because you were just spitting like you were back at the hip hop shop. It was like it was sick. And I was I was so happy that you weren't brain damaged and right. permanently disabled from rapping like that again when i listen to it now it's still like it gives me chills listening to underground so i got really excited you're recording everything's rolling you're recording some stuff with accents we don't realize it's going on you make 3 a.m you come up with the serial killer vibe and we use that to sort of market the record and as the the catalyst for the creative 
um, surrounding the marketing campaign, the video for 3 a.m., which I'm sure you remember. We spoke to James about it, and he just remembered how shitty the weather was and that you got into that bathtub full of blood and we couldn't heat it up quick enough. Do you remember that? It was cold, right? Oh, so cold. Yeah. Yeah. But you were you were bold. And then I reminded him that like you you're someone who's never like been shy to do your own stunts. Going back to the role model video, you yourself were hung upside down in that water chamber. Yeah. Right? Yeah, that was fun. Fun time. You don't think why didn't we think to get a double for that? Like it didn't need to be you. Right. Well, can we go back and redo it? Yeah, let's redo it. Yeah, get Phil and Dre on the phone and we'll just redo the fucking thing. Yeah. So, so relapse, relapse comes up, comes out of that, that whole process. It's born of that time where you were relapsing back into the game and you had a certain feeling about it afterwards, right? Yeah. Tell us what, cause you, I'm sure most people listening to this know how you feel about the album, but tell us what, what your thoughts were after you released it. After relapse? Yeah. I remember we was, we was in Hawaii, I think. And at some point I was listening to maybe something from the Eminem show or some shit. I remember Uh listening to some of my older shit and going, why don't my shit, like, it don't feel like anything right now. So when we did that, the first recording session we did for recovery was in Hawaii with Dre. Mm Mm-hmm. And uh, I think the first before, thing before that, what, what, what were your, what, what did you think about looking back at that point And now what do you, what are your feelings on relapse? Well, I don't have a problem with some of the rhymes and I don't have a problem with some of the verses as far as lyrically. Mm-hmm. It's just that the accents, like I, I, like I felt like I sounded so demented in that shit that I got cemented in that shit. Right. And then I bent it back, bitch. And then I went to scratch itch. You felt like you were you were stuck in it and you felt like you just went way too heavy on the accent. So I, it kind of it was literally like a fucking awakening and it happened in like fucking ten five minutes, ten minutes, listening to some of my older shit and going, I need it to feel like this again. And the first song I did out there was the one Mr. Porter did, On Fire. You're talking about off oh on, on fire. fire, yeah. Yep. So, the- so we're we're going to move into we're going to move into recovery. But before we do, I wanted to talk a little bit about something and clear something up. At at the time we were creating relapse, we were going to make it a double album. You had yeah. enough songs you thought to make a relapse too, mm-hmm. right? And at some point, you decided to not do that. And I think it was at the point where you said, "Okay, enough with this accent stuff." But what we did was we put a bunch of those songs out as relapse refill, right? Yep. Yep. And then some songs leaked out, right? So there was maybe three or four more of those from those sessions leaked out, but that was it. And the reason I'm bringing that up is because a lot of your fans think that there's some hidden relapse two album. Can you just clear that up? I mean, there's probably enough to make another relapse too. (laughs) Like when not, I go back not and, that hasn't not that hasn't either leaked out or that was used on relapse refill. Wait, say that again, because there's not enough songs to make an album, not even close, that either weren't included on relapse refill or that had leaked out. There are a lot of songs still that did not leak out from relapse. From relapse, yep. Okay, so then your fans are demanding that you release them. Well, fuck. That's a setup. I'm just saying. I, I'm trying to clear it up because they think that I'm holding back some relapse two project. But you're saying there's enough songs for one. Yeah, there's we'll, a, we'll there, there might be, but but they're terrible songs. And if they didn't okay. even make the the albums on relapse, and I right. feel how I feel about relapse, then that should say something. Right. So just put it put it to bed right now. Tell your fans there's not going to be a relapse two, right? All two of them. There's no relapse too. All right, there it is.
So moving forward, you go in and you start creating recovery. You said the first song you did was on fire. And mm -hmm. that's another record like underground. It's like you just spitting crazy, right? Yeah. So you lose the accent. And I think you went in with an, an intent to like, I don't want to say reclaim your spot, but you were, you were going for it with recovery. Well, I was looking at like at the time too, like Drake and Wayne and, and looking at how they started changing the landscape of shit. And I think it also pushed me, it motivated me to, if you remember this was, this recovery was like the first album back with me back on the wordplay, right? Because I started yeah. getting away from it and on relapse, on relapse, I don't think there's much, any much of wordplay on it. So I started getting back into that shit. You started making big records, <clears throat> right? I mean, you, you weren't, you know, sort of just stuck in this happiness to rap. You, I think we're looking to sort of, you know, expand a bit because yeah. there were some massive records on that album and it's stuff like that doesn't happen by accident as much as people might think it does. So, you know, there was some intent to go big, right? I don't know about in the beginning, but yeah, like j just, just me seeing what's going on in the game at that time. I was watching Wayne like, holy shit, word plays back. Like I can do that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like at the hip hop shop, that was all, I really cared about back then was like those kind of punch punchline rap and shit like that. And I don't know if it made me like, I, I, I think it made me rediscover wordplay was watching what Wayne was doing. Okay. So what, one of the other things though, I think that's important to, to point out is you go to Hawaii, you're doing sessions with Dre, you get some tracks from Mr. Porter. And then we made a decision to sort of, open up the field, so to speak. Right. Bringing right? in Just Blaze. And so we brought in producers that you hadn't really worked with before. <clears throat> and Just Blaze comes to Detroit. And I think that really set the tone for the record. Right. Yeah. Because he did. came in. Yeah. So he came in and, and you know, Just <clears throat> Blaze produced No Love, which is an incredible song. He produced, let's see, You're Never Over. Right. Yeah. Was it A Cold Wind Blows? Cold Wind Blows was one of the first one. That, the, the first one I did didn't make it to the album. I don't even okay. remember what it was called, but I know that Cold Wind Blows was the, the second one I made. Right. And that really set the tone. And you guys developed a rhythm, learned, you know, you got to know each other and started making some amazing shit. And then we, we sort of opened it up even more. We got records from, from Jim Johnson. I know some of our A&R guys brought in some records too. And all of a sudden, everything's starting to really take shape, Right. Yeah. And, you know, including including Not Afraid. Right. Which is another producer you hadn't worked with before. Yep. Boy, wonder. Mm -hmm. So you've got all these producers you hadn't worked with before. There's some great vocal features rounding out the record. You've got Not Afraid. And what happens? Do you remember? Yeah, I, I was done. I was like, man, I'm done. And you was like, OK, I know you keep saying you're done. But but I got but I have one beat. You need to hear. Yeah. It was more than a beat. It was a beat and a chorus. But yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, had, I had something that I thought was really special. And I told you, I know you're done, but I have this record and I just want you to hear it. If you don't like it, you don't want to use it, fine. But you just, you have to listen to this, right? Mm -hmm. And what happened after you heard it? I got it in the car on the way home and I wrote two verses. Well, a verse and a half. Right. And you called I even me got up home and said, you're an asshole. Yep. Because you were mad that I had to, it made you keep working, right? On a record that you thought where you were done with. You wrote everything really quickly. So you get done, you record your verses, you send it back to me. And you said, okay, here you go, tough guy. I'm done with the record. But now, now you got to put Rihanna on it. Yeah. Because in your mind, what you had written about and what the chorus was about, she was the only one that could pull it off. Mm-hmm. Right. Yep. So do you remember how we ended up being lucky enough to get her to do the record? I remember we wanted her like I wanted to get her for any song. Right. Right. So I, th there was actually an attempt, another attempt, earlier attempt to get her 
on something. On a different record. Yep. Yeah. It actually leaked. It's uh, what was that song called? Fly Away. Fly Away. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So she was on the road, if you recall. And she, I think, was in Dublin. Oh, yeah. We that's had to right. get her. You remember that? Yep. And we had to get her in the studio while she was on the road, which, you know, artists hate doing that. You hate doing that, right? I mean, yeah. you're out doing, you're out already working. And then somebody's, it's like pulling double duty. And she understood, I think, what the record could have been. So she went in the studio and cut it in Dublin. And I think she just absolutely nailed it, right? Right out of the gate. Mm -hmm. So you get the parts, we mix the record, and now we're sitting here with Love the Way You Lie. Yep. So now we really got something because you got these spitting records, you've got what we think are at least a couple massive hits, right? And opening up with all these other producers and we were on the run. So Recovery comes out and did incredibly well. Not Afraid was a hit. Love the way you lie. Massive hit. Both Remember of those when, songs. when I played you Not Afraid? What'd you say? You I said, didn't think I didn't think that I wasn't sure that it was a smash. I wasn't sure. You said, I like it. I do. <laughs> and I was like, what a dick. All right. You remember well, I called you when I had without me. I called you when I had without me and, and I tried to play it for you over the phone. And you was like, I, I was like, know. yo, I think I got it. I think I got it. And you're like, all right, calm down, calm down. Like, I, I need to hear it in person. Anyway. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. I loved that beat. I know that much. I always loved the without me beat. Anyway, so you had massive success and you were, you know, back where you were before any of the sort of miscalculations or missteps happened. Yeah. And it was, it was a great thing. So then after recovery comes the Marshall Mathers LP, yep. right? Mm -hmm. So tell me about what you remember of, of that process, because it was three years in between recovery and the Marshall Mathers LP. I know that Legacy was the first song I recorded for that. Mm -hmm. And I think that I had about, I want to say I had about five songs that I, that I think I had like five or six songs and you had said something to the effect of this sounds like the Mathers LP with some of the songs right. that you, that I played for you. At yeah, some point gave you me said some that. Feelings like that. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought, oh, well that could be crazy. I need to like, I always feel like I need some kind of at least one holy shit moment. I just kept racking my brain like, what the fuck could I talk about? And then I'd, I had to go back, listen to the album. And then I thought like, you know what would be crazy? Is if Stan's dead, but if his little brother came back. Right, Matthew. Yeah. So People, Everybody forgot about Matthew. And I was trying to make it so that it almost sounded like a relationship song was coming on mm -hmm. with it, that you're the first thing you're hearing off the album. Bad guy. Yeah. Bad guy. And it, I, I wanted to paint now <laughs> that that's kind of the, the, the drawback from the internet is because you don't get to have people experience music like that anymore. People tell you what I'm talking about. I said this, I said that, then they go to it and they're not impressed at all because they already know the ending. They are, you know what I'm saying? So it kind of, yeah. but regardless, or they hear it out of context or yeah. in, in the wrong sequence or whatever. And there's nothing you can do to control it. Yeah. The goal was to make you think I'm talking to, to I'm talking to a chick to try to get revenge for fucking me over. Uh -huh. And then all of a sudden I need, you know, I needed one line to like, for you to be like, Oh, wait, the what the fuck? You know what I'm saying? So that yeah. the song's taking you on this journey, but then you realize that, oh shit, he's not, this ain't him. It's, it's Matthew talking to him. But that was the, the whole, the holy shit moment. Yeah. You know, you're, you're very good at creating these twists and you know, you've been doing it since the beginning and you lead people down a path and they think you're going one way and then they open up the door and they're 
someplace completely different they didn't think they were going to be in, right? Yeah. So that's kind of what you mean. And I think another oh shit moment for that record, or that album is is Rap God. You know, that to me is some of the most, you know, dazzling lyrics, lyricism that you ever recorded. What What do you remember about making that record? Because, you know, that was one that when people first heard it, they were like, what the fuck? I don't remember exactly how it came about, but I do remember that when I first recorded it, and this was, I'm still playing CDs back then. I'm listening yeah. to it in the car. And when it cuts off, it says six minutes. And I'm like, what the fuck? You know, the time on the CD. Yep. I'm like, what the fuck? That shit's exactly six minutes. That's crazy. So I went back in the beginning and did the six minutes, six minutes. Cause I don't even think I knew or realized how long the song was at the time, at least until I got it in the car. And I'm like, I just made a fucking six minute song. Right. Of like nonstop rapping, by the way. Yeah. I mean, there's a chorus, but it, it's not really that long. And you, you just are just rapping and rapping and rapping. And when you did the part where you went sort of what I call hyperspeed, right? Or warp mm-hmm. speed. And you did the, the JJ fad thing. Yeah. What, what made you think of that record? Why, why was that the record that you, that you went to? I, for some reason... Some of Lama Duma Lama stuck in my head one day. Mm-hmm. And I just kept repeating the phrase. I remember some of Lama Duma Lama. Some of Lama Duma Lama. That rhymes with a lot of shit. I started thinking of shit to rhyme with it. And that kind of that kind of stunt like that, I guess you'd call it a stunt. I don't know if you call it a stunt, but like that kind of shit like has to be the right words that roll off the tongue. You got to pick the uh-huh. right one. You know what I'm saying? Like, you can't just, like, you have to let each word, you assuming I'm a human, what I got to do to get it through to you, I'm like. Human? Yeah. But you have to pick the right phrases and words that are going to roll up the tongue. Otherwise, it's going to be sloppy and sound like shit. So, I don't know. It just kind of led me into the next phrase and the next phrase. And I remember thinking when I wrote it in my head, I'm like, when I go to the studio, am I going to be able to say this shit? Because sometimes the shit that I write, sometimes my mouth can't say it. Right. I don't know why, but sometimes your that head, it, it works in your head. But then when you go to run it through your actual mouth, yeah, it doesn't function that way. Bro, I did that shit. I think the, the, the first take of it, I got like halfway through it. And then I was God. like, okay, all right, cool. I can do, you know what I'm saying? Like, I can do this now. Let me, let me focus on saying it right. the best way I can. Yeah. It's what I got to do to get it through to you. I'm superhuman, super innovative, right. innovative, rubber. So that what I say is. Anything you say. Anything you say is whatever the fuck. Shane. Yeah. So the other thing you told me, because there came a time where there was an opportunity to perform the song. Yeah. And I didn't. I thought that there was no way that you'd be able to do it. And when the opportunity came up, we did it for the, the YouTube music awards and we yeah. did like a live music video. Yeah. And when the opportunity came up and I went to you and I said, I really think it would be great if you can do this, but can you do it? You said, yeah. Do you remember what you said about it? No. You told me that you had written it with that in mind and that there was pauses in there purposely. Oh, yeah, in the yeah. Schemes. Yep. Right. Yeah. So that you could catch your breath. Yep. I mean, that's incredible. So you, not only you have the task of making something that's great and making a great song and doing this super high level of lyricism, but you're also putting together a song with the intent of, Hey, I might have to perform this live. Mm-hmm. Right. And every time I do something like that, I make sure that my mouth can say it because I always keep in mind I might have to do this live. So this can't be no fucking studio trick. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, yes, yeah. I have to be able to actually say it. So, yeah. I mean, that's a stunt. That's like a, a feat. Like it's a funny because back. it's funny because is, is as much of a stunt as that is like Godzilla yeah. is actually faster than that. Right. And well, that's yeah. But that comes later. We did. We, we right, right, right. Got into, that's Mach 3. We're, we're hey, Mach 2. I'll right tell now. you, it's funny because I remember we, we were thinking back in the day for, with Forgot About Dre that that was like some cutting edge shit. 
motherfuckers yeah. acting like it was like like that was like the groundbreaking shit or something. Right. Yeah, that double time flow. Yeah, right? but it really is not that fast when you think about it. So no, not compared to where you went. No, nah, they just got to be the right words, man. You got to choose the right words to roll off the tongue. Isn't that the truth? Mm-hmm. So we, we put out the Marshall Mathers LP, which had a couple more big records on it. It had The Monster, which was another Rihanna collaboration. She was gracious enough to do another record with you. Do you remember getting getting that process? Because at that point you knew her, mm -hmm. right? And it wasn't just like, hey, help me get Rihanna on this record. It was, I think you, you called her yourself. Yeah. So what was that conversation like? I can't remember. Well, I sort of remember because initially I don't think she wanted to do it, right? Okay. Because she, she, I think she felt like you guys had done something great and I don't, she wasn't sure whether you guys would be able to top it. Right. But I think that you, you were convinced that it was a big record and told her to, I think, just sort of trust you on that. And she did. Do you remember that? I do kind of remember that now. I can't remember yeah. exactly what the, what, what, some of that I remember. Yeah. From that conversation. Well, I've, I've had a lot of conversations with her. So it was like, I'm trying to, cause we had, a, we had a couple different collabs and shit like that for, for her shit too. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> but that one in particular, I think she was hesitant because she didn't know whether it was going to top what you guys had done, be, did, did before. And you were convinced that you, you had a smash on your hands and, and just asked well, her. I, to knew, I knew that, that she would sound crazy singing it, especially the, that mm -hmm. shit. Yeah. Like, the high part, like yeah, the, the yodel. That's her shit. So like, I just felt like, man, she could probably fucking smash this shit. Yeah. And, you know, she's Rihanna. So like, her that name is. is huge. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. I mean, you guys have a couple incredible collaborations together, which obviously led to you guys doing those stadium shows together, which was also just fucking incredible. But so from, from the Marshall Mathers LP two, just to dial back for a second, this is also the first time that you work with Rick Rubin. Yep. So tell me about that because, you know, we, we've talked a lot about, about Rick and, and our feelings about him and what he means to us. And certainly the influence that he had on us when we were just fans and we weren't in the music industry yet. Right. Yeah. What was that like when you first met him? What do you remember? Well, I remember that the first time I met him was with you we went to his house and his house was still like under construction. Like it was still being built. Right. And and the house, his house in Malibu. Yeah. I went to use his bathroom and after I used the bathroom, I'm like, there's no, there's, I got to dry my hands and there was just paper towel in there. Right. So dried my hands. <laughs> there was no garbage. So I put the toilet paper in the, or I put the, the paper, paper towel, towel in the toilet, hit flush and <laughs> started overflowing. So Everybody like, knows you're not supposed to do that, bro. Yeah, but I mean, I didn't even realize it until I didn't want to walk out there with a fucking handful of paper towels. There was nowhere to put them, so I walked so back out there up, with you guys, you and I didn't say Rick anything because I'm toilet. like, what? In his brand new house, you stuff up Rick Rubin's toilet. Yep. Did it overflow? It it came up to about just at the rim, like it just at the rim, and I don't know if it I was. <laughs> I walked away. So I don't know. Did you say what anything? happened? No, I didn't say anything because it was the first you time dirty, I met him. Dirty man. I was like, yo, I hope that that fucking, there ain't water all over the floor. It's oh very possible. God. It's very possible too, that, that he knows that I did that. If it, if it went totally fucked as it, yeah. it was, it looked like it was going. Do you, you know, think he's trying to get away you? from something? So, so that you won't be the last one that was in there that might've did that. So they think it might have been somebody else? Yeah. Right. So do you think if, if he knows, he's probably forgiven you at this point? Probably, or he doesn't know that I did it, or I don't know. I got to okay. ask him. I never told him about that. Well, so aside from, from clogging up Rick Rubin's toilet the first time you met him, what what? because I remember I'd worked for a while to to try to get that meeting together, right? And I had met with Rick on my own and talked to him. And, yeah. you know, one thing I said to him is like, you know, there's a lot of pressure for us 
on this record to, you know, we we're coming off recovery and, and we, we need to, you know, to deliver again. And I'm just not sure w- right now what, what an Eminem hit should sound like. I yeah. said to him, right. And he said, what are you talking about? And I said, well, you know, like, I don't know what direction he should be going. And he goes, why are you even thinking about that? And I said, what do you mean? What should I be thinking about? He goes, just think about making great music. Nothing else matters. <laughs> it sounded like good imitation. Yeah. Just make great music. Don't worry about that. Yeah. If it's great, then people are going to love it. You know what I said to him? That always has stuck with me. We was doing something when we first started working with Rick and, and, and I was like, I played him a couple songs. I don't remember how many I had at the time. And I was like, well, Paul wanted me to let off the gas a little bit. And he was like, what? Paul wanted you to let off the gas. Are you crazy? <laughs> like, I don't know what to do. Like, rapping is, you know, like, I don't, I don't know. Is it, was that at a time where you were just doing a lot of really fast stuff? Something you said, something you said it was, it was hard. It was that di- it wasn't digestible or some shit like that. Something like that. Okay. And so I let off the gas and I was trying to like, you know, some people like when I rap fast, some people don't. So yeah trying to make songs like they, they were more digestible but i'm always i'm also always worried that if i just do that then people are like oh he fell off he can't rap anymore you've got a very difficult job of trying to please every type of fan every aspect of what they like and at the same time continue to be successful and you know have records that perform like it, it's it's almost impossible you, you have a very, very, very difficult job. But, you know, one of the things that we have to do, and me, we being managers, right, is we've got to bring you information that we think should be shared with mm-hmm. you, right? So at the time, I probably felt like, based upon feedback, experience, et cetera, that you were doing something too much. And I don't remember exactly what it was. Actually, that time period, if you, mm-hmm. I don't know if, I've talked about this publicly or not, but I know me and you have had the discussion about there was a few years where my tinnitus was getting really bad. Right. And like the ringing in my ears was almost louder than the music. So what started happening is slowly but surely over time, I started putting all this, like I started putting extra mid range in my voice, like because for me to get it out, and be able to hear it for whatever reason, that was the tone that was like easiest for my ears to, to hear the inflections and shit like that. And then as we went to LA and saw that doctor and the tinnitus started getting better, I started pulling back on the vocal a little bit. Right. And trying to find a, like Royce always calls it that, that sweet spot. But yeah. going back and listening to that, that shit. Now I realize, like, man, I, I fucking, I didn't, I didn't leave any gaps. I didn't, you know what I'm saying? Like everything was like there was no, there was no, no parts to be able to breathe. It yeah, was everything was just continued. Yeah. yeah, and that's probably what I was telling, ta- talking about. Yep. So, so you told Rick, and he said that I was crazy or 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 misinformed or whatever. How did Berserk come about? Hmm. Well. So I brought you a record. We won't even say what it was, right? And it was a a rock and roll song. And I thought it would make for a great hip hop record. And one of the things that Rick did in the process of making Marshall Mathers LP too, the first time we all worked together is he said, tell me if there's any records that you guys have always wanted to sample and turn into songs, right? Yeah, and I remember I told him time of the season. Time for the season, yeah. Yeah. I mentioned that one to him in that first yes. in that first interview in, interview right. which, I mean, which you used which you you definitely used. So for me it was you know one of the records was was this this rock song. I brought it in. You guys started working on it. Rick had a relationship or with with the artist or his manager said you were working on it and he he shut it down. The artist shut it down, right? Yep. So we said, well, this is too good to throw away. What's like it? Right? Yeah. What do we, what can we, what else can we find to work with? And so we, I I had, I don't know if it was you or me or both of us 
w- really liked the, the Billy Squire record, the Stroke. You, I think you said that because I think it was your idea because you said, I, I think that there's a, there, at some point in time, I sampled that on another song and tried to fuck with it. And right. I think you said something like, well, what about that Billy Squire shit? Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, oh, shit. Okay, let me try that. And uh, I think it definitely probably came out a better song, not using the original. For sure. Sample that we were going to use. Mm-hmm. But For sure. Yeah. And and it had that sort of old throwback, you know, Rick Rubin sound, like, you know, the hard rock guitars, big sampled drums, scratches. Remember how much we love the 99 Problems. Exactly. And and right. how he did that that record. And, and I remember thinking like, man, I just need one of those. Yeah. One of those kind of beats. That was definitely the inspiration for it. Yeah, for sure. So so you guys did a bunch of records on there and it really shaped the album and it turned into something that was different from anything you had done before. One thing we skipped over before you released the Marshall Mathers LP, I said there was three years in between. You had the Bad Meets Evil project. And, you know, you were at a point then, I think, where you just wanted to rap, Mm -hmm. right? So that gave you the outlet to do that. And it did yield a smash, though, you know, the song Lighters. So do you remember how how that came about? I think in the very beginning, it was Royce's idea to try to get Bruno. But I think that he he was kind of like me with the thought, like, would he even do it? Right. You know what I'm saying? So, like... Yeah, because Bruno was blowing up and, and, you know, you guys were putting out this EP and it was like right. on some rap shit. Yeah. So f- it, you, had a re- you had a record that Royce had brought in and it had a version of the chorus on there, right? It wasn't yeah. the same because Bruno yeah. changed it. Yep. So And he took it and rem- made that shit incredible, bro, because yeah, I thought the hook was good to first, you know, the original hook, but he changed the whole thing. Like keeping right. the concept, but he changed the whole shit. And bro, that dude can fucking sing, man. Jesus Christ. Yeah, he expanded the record. I think is the best way to put it. Yeah, definitely gave it gave it like a much broader horizon and and a higher ceiling for sure. Yeah, and he also added production elements to it, right? I don't remember exactly what, but I but I think he you know because he had that his team the uh, Smeezingtons, right? Yeah. And they, they, him and another guy, I think, and they were definitely adding production elements to the song and just, you know, really enhanced it and made it great. Yeah, so I don't you, even remember what the original version sounded like, honestly, the, the original beat. But, I, but I, I do remember that now that, yeah, he definitely changed, like, some chords and a bunch of shit that made it feel even better. Yeah. Yeah. What a great, what a great record it came out to be. So you guys released that... Very well received Bad Meets Evil project. Also had the single Fast Lane, which was really dope with with Sly on the chorus. And then we moved forward. We talked about the Marshall Mathers LP. And then after that, there was another sort of break in time. I think you were working on some some other projects. You know, we had uh, some soundtrack stuff. You had Slaughterhouse was coming out. Slaughterhouse was coming out. And then eventually we, we get to Revival. So do you remember what that process was like or what, what you were thinking in, in the time that you made that record? Because I think that there was a lot of sort of thought around what the project should be. And you had a lot on your mind and a lot of stuff you wanted to say. Yeah. I'm trying to think of the first song that started that album. Like, like the first song I did. Cause I can't remember. Well, I think believe was one of the early records. Yep. Believe was one. Yep. Right. And I think that there was records like, I think Framed was fairly early on yeah, in the process. I think so. Yep. And then, you know, you started to to make some other records and got some people on records, right? Like we got Nowhere Fast, we got Kalani to do, and we got obviously, you know, one of the singles from the record, which was just sort of massive and unbelievable that we were able to to get her to do was we got Beyonce. Yep. She did Walk on Water. I remember this a little bit, but tell me what you remember about creating that record, because that was something you worked on with Rick out, out of his studio, right? Yeah, I think Skylar sent it to, to Skylar sent it to Rick, and then Rick was playing it, but not for me. He, he I think he was just playing it and I walked in. I was like, what the fuck is that? Right. 
And, and it was just piano and Skylar singing. Yep. So what was the process of making that record? Because it's not a traditional record. There's no fucking drums on it. When he played it for me, I was like, I instantly started thinking of lines to it. So mm-hmm. I was like, yo, give me that and I'll record it in the other room. Right. So I sat there and wrote it and recorded it pretty quick. Yeah. And do you do you remember whether there was the intent of keeping it without drums or is it something that you thought that you might add drums on later? I think because I think you guys were up in the air on it. I think so, too. But I think that once I laid the vote, like once I wrote the rap, because I wrote it with, with no drums in it. So, you know, it's basically just what you're hearing in my head. So it was just that in the in the my vocal in the piano. So I think that once I laid it, we kind of knew like we shouldn't put drums in it. Right. Yeah. I think after you guys, after you recorded it, you know, it was, it was obviously powerful and there was a lot of power in the fact that the music didn't distract from the message and what you were saying. So I think that you guys were pretty convinced early on that you were going to leave it without drums and I always wanted you guys to try it, I think, but it it never happened. But regardless, you know, really powerful record, strong, you know, sort of emotionally revealing stuff in it from you. Yeah. And then we we to have Skylar on it and we think about somebody who would sound great on it. And I don't know whose idea it was, but I think that I think that Rick may have reached out to Jay Z. I think he did, too. I think it was his idea to try to get Beyonce to do it. And I was like, man, she ain't doing that shit. <laughs> There's no fucking way. And Is that because you just didn't think she wanted to do that record or a record with you? Or I just or mean what? like, I don't know. Like she's really big, <laughs> right? Right. She's got a lot going yeah, on. Beyonce. So I just kind of thought it was a, a stab in the dark. And if we could, you know, it, it was like a fantasy thing. If we could get her, oh my God, that shit would be crazy. And if we yeah. couldn't, I didn't want to let myself down. Got it. So the fact that so, she did it was crazy to me. Yeah. Yeah, man. She killed it. She fucking smashed it. She sure did. It was amazing to get her on that. So do you think that you want to discuss at all about, you know, how the record was received or why you think that I'm not talking about that song, I'm talking about the album or why you think it was received that way or what you remember about, about that? Because I know you've, you've talked about it in the recent past. Yeah. Shit. I don't know where to start with that. I mean, maybe just a few things of what, what you were feeling about the way, the way people reacted to it and why you think that may have been. All right. Can I, let me, can we take a bathroom break? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. 